I'm on a golf holiday and I've decided to turn it into a geology field trip. This is because geology controls landscapes and just on this golf course alone we can tell stories of earthquakes, ancient seas and even why the course has been shaped in the way it has. But fair warning from the outset, a pro golfer, I am not. So where am I today? Well, I am in southern Spain in a little place called Islantia. It's a golf resort and it is beautiful. And in fact, almost all of the footage today is either from the golf course or the pathway that runs along its southern extremity. And I'm going to start off on the path because that's where the best outcrop I saw was. This is the bit I'm excited for because I know I've got cliffs around here. It's too much tree to see it properly. Oh, I'm getting a hint. This is exciting. Look at the beautiful fountain and kapow. Look at that. That is gorgeous. Someone's put an annoying fountain in the way, which is obscuring my rocks, but you can see what's going on behind it. Let's have a closer look. Little frog. Oh, there he goes. <laughs> anyway, let's look back at the cliffs instead of the frog. So the first thing you end up noticing is that it forms into almost like these pillars. Now that is 100% due to how the water's coming off and eroding them. These vertical features you see is the effect of gullying. The reason it's happening so much here is partly because this lower rock is very sandy and weakly bonded, but also because it's warm around here and vegetation is sparse. So when it rains, the water just runs off, carving out the rock as it goes. It is nuts. Look, tiny bits up on the top. Yeah. So my mum's just pointed out these bits. So the little capping bits almost look like little mushroom fungi yeah. growing on top. Those are where the layer above it is a little bit more resistant to weathering than the quite fine stuff underneath. So it stays a bit more intact, like a little block that can't be eroded away as easily. Eventually gravity gets the better of it, but at least to start with, it erodes away the underneath a lot more. And it, it carries on like this all the way along. So you can see some of the bits here have lost the capping tops. Oh, that's beautiful in there. You've even got like a little archway. A that's so cute. <laughs> this is very, it's very sci-fi. In fact, there's something been burrowing in the tops up there. I wonder what kind of animal does that? Yeah. Don't know. Can you also see how the cliffs here are a different colour to the cliffs up here? Well, that is due to the fact there's two differing rock units and these rock units make quite a difference in this area. At the top of the cliff we have these really red pebbly rocks bound with red clays that we call conglomerates. These are the youngest rocks around here formed only in the Quaternary or the last few million years. They're very lumpy and have lots of pebbles washed here from further inland. I found some weathered out bits on the side of the path and went and had a closer look. So this rock is definitely some sort of quartzite rich metamorphic type rock. So this has probably come from the hills up to the north. Well, it has. It's, sorry, I've got my shopping here. You'll also notice the pebbles are pretty well rounded, telling us they've travelled a fair way to get here too. I think I got drawn to the rocks. Is that you? That's you. I've got to say, I had a bad habit the whole way around of aiming at these conglomerates because I kept staring at them. Great for geology, awful for my score. Into the bunker! <laughs> Pretend I did that to talk about the sands next. <clears throat> so below the red conglomerates we have a couple of sand and silt units, generally a lot finer than the material overlying it. So if the conglomerate formed in high energy environments, these would have formed in lower energy, where waters were more settled. There's delicate sandy layers, but also some quite stubborn ones that have become cemented. This is where groundwater has deposited minerals in this layer that has stuck the grains together better. So the difference in these two rock units, this one and this one, actually can kind of explain how the whole golf course is built. So I will show you a map with the geology overlaid and you can kind of see how the geology itself controls where the golf course is. I'm going to lay the geology map over slowly and see if you can spot what's going on here. So this is the full geology map and I'm just going to take it off again. So you'll see that the red and grey stripy bit sits where the buildings are and the orangey bits tends to sit where the fairways are. It's not foolproof admittedly but it is a trend. The red and grey bits are the conglomerates. 
These are sitting proud on the top of the hill with some gravel that might be good for building buildings on. The oranges are some of the sands, well draining, easier to regrade and form a natural river valley. Those orange sandy units might be better off as a fairway. Now I'm pretty sure they didn't sit there with a geology map when they were designing the golf course, but the geology has controlled the landscape here and therefore they've built the course around the existing landscape. Once I could see it, I couldn't unsee it. EG here, so I drive along next to the buildings here that are on the upper bit and look over to my left and there's the fairway down in the dip on the sandy stone. There's exceptions to the rule because sometimes it just makes sense to have a green with a nice view. But there's an undeniable pattern, and on this hole I even got a treat for seeing the red conglomerate stick out my bunker. There's one other key thing that we can glean from this map though. You'll notice there's two rather large black lines crossing the area. My gorgeous outcrop that I got very excited over at the front is actually situated here, dead on where that line is. Another thing that's really worth talking about. Note that behind me, the ground is really flat. And then when I swing round, we got a cliff. Why would that be? Now this is something so exciting. So this area is down relative to this area. Now you might be aware that in the Mediterranean they get earthquakes and earthquakes happen when faults move. So what's a fault? It's literally when two rocks move relative to each other. So for something like this, this actually shows us where a fault has occurred. Now I don't know the last time this one had an earthquake on it, but this cuts the entire front of the coast of this area and it gives this whole area a stepped approach. So the golf course, for example, is on the top, whereas all the beach and resort places are on the bottom. And yeah, makes for some gorgeous views and this really dramatic scenery. Now I stupidly, when I went to the beach part, meant to take a video back up the hill, but I completely forgot because I was too busy worrying about getting a Fanta. So, this, you can see, pretty much use that waterfall as a marker. That is pretty much the plane of this fault that I'm talking about. And you can see the cliffs up there. And the path along the south of the golf course broadly, roughly, kind of follows this fault. So the next logical question is, well, what caused the fault? Well, due to the fact that the Eurasian plate and the African plate are currently colliding, there's some insane tectonics going off off the coast of Spain and Portugal. I am not going to dig into the absolute depths of it because, quite frankly, I didn't investigate enough while I was here. But broadly, it's squishing in a north-south direction. The very tectonic plates themselves are buckling and folding underneath, so pressure is relieved by little faults moving. But they're not all moving at once, and I have no idea if the one that I was looking at has moved at all in recent years. So I looked up the earthquake mapping from the time that I was out there, and there was definitely something going on. It was just so minor, I couldn't have even told you it was going on. In fact, when I filtered for only earthquakes that were bigger than magnitude 2, there was not very many at all. But still a hell of a lot more than old Blighty. This trip has done nothing but make me want to travel for rocks more often, as I was very much here for golf, not geology this time. I've got a sneaky international trip in the diary for next spring, but let me know in the comments if you've got any good suggestions. Because for context, it's actually quicker for me to get to Portugal than it is Yorkshire, I know, I don't make the rules. But I will see you back in England because I'm definitely not starting a career as a golfer.